Before this video starts, I just want to say that near the end, we're going to be talking about some seriously confronting stuff. So, please bear that in mind. Life, and by extension, human civilization, generally, as a rule, unfortunately, does not conform to what is just. Rather, it conforms to the will of those with power. As the French philosopher Pascal points out, justice is subject to dispute, while might is easily recognised and hence not disputed. Therefore, we cannot grant might to justice because might has already gained said justice. In essence, might makes right, and thus dictates what will be. But every so often throughout history, there is a collective will among free people to defend what is right, and justice prevails. And as we have seen over the past month, the Ukrainians have not only risen to that challenge, they have outright triumphed. To give a quick recap of the situation thus far, Kiev was projected to fall by the end of February. Captured Russian plans seem to indicate this, as well as their other preparations. They only deployed 190,000 men for a country larger than Iraq, and Iraq took half a million men to take. And a logistics capacity for less than a month of intensive operations, all of this information suggests a force that predicted a walkover. This would be an easy mission. And the conduct of their initial invasion seems to support this as well. An air assault launched against one of the city's major airports. Infantry units just barreling down highways with no regard to potential ambushes or mounting security. All of these operations conducted without fighter cover from the Air Force or any suppression of enemy air defense preceding those missions. Aside from the initial barrage of cruise missiles and artillery, no significant SAM suppression operations were flown, resulting in heavy losses in the Russian Air Forces to S-300 and OZA SAM systems. Armoured advances were launched through towns without any dismounted infantry support, leading to horrific ambushes and terrible casualties. The streets and highways of Ukraine, as we've seen in the photos coming out of the war for the past month, are nothing but a graveyard for Russian armoured vehicles. And standing out above all this is the abject failure of the Russian Air Force in general. Their failure to mount a standing air superiority presence over the country, resulting in losses to Ukrainian fighters, while Ukrainian Sukhoi ground attack aircraft and the now famous TB-2 Bayraktar drones, see I learned to pronounce it correctly, pound Russian air defense systems into the dust, allowing for follow-up sorties to hit their supply convoys and their armored units, which they have been doing to great effect. And all the while, the Ukrainians have been mounting nothing but unwavering resistance for every inch of ground from their National Guard units, while their professional Ukrainian army fights a mobile defense, hitting on the counterattack, inflicting maximum losses for minimum expenditure. The NATO training and equipment has been paying huge dividends, and after over a month of combat, what I've termed the miracle on the Dnieper, the thing which every analyst, every historian, everybody, including me, thought was impossible, the miracle has happened. The Russian forces have been turned back from Kiev, Sumy, and Chernihiv, forced back over the border into Belarus in a moment that'll be talked about in history books. It should be stressed, however, that this war is far from over, and this withdrawal of Russian forces has been matched by an intensification of Russian operations and offensive actions in the eastern half of the country, leading many to speculate that this withdrawal is simply a redeployment, demonstrating a changing of priority for the Russian high command. But make no mistake, the Russians intended to take the capital and they failed, forcing them to rethink their plans. It is, with no doubt in my mind, Ukraine's first major strategic victory. Across my previous videos, I have given more complete overviews regarding the cause of Russia's operational issues, but I would like to follow up with two things, because I've made a mistake and I need to be held accountable in both cases. First, I am a historian, not a foreign policy expert, and I'm operating from a military history perspective, and I'm using open source intelligence and statements from ministries of defense, 
which due to the fog of war means reporting with an incomplete picture. So everything reported in my videos and here as well is subject to change and may be adjusted for the historical record. And leading on from that, I need to start with the corrections and updates based on new information for the sake of transparency and accuracy. First of all, in my previous video, I mentioned that Russia does not have an indigenous GPS navigation and ordnance guidance system available. This was a generalized statement based on its effectiveness rather than its actual existence, and such it was misleading, so I'll correct the record. Russia does indeed have its own system known as GLONASS. However, it has significant limitations when compared to GPS due to the lower density of satellites and generally inferior onboard technology, resulting in its performance not being good enough to conduct terminal guidance for precision weapon systems, with an estimated 85% accuracy loss outside of Russian territory. As such, they hook into GPS where possible for navigation and guidance systems to refine their capability. This access has been denied or jammed where possible, as part of the ongoing war and the sanctions against Russia. And reports of captured Russian equipment and downed aircraft seem to indicate that the rollout of GLONASS across their military is far less prevalent than Western analysts anticipated. Worse still for the Russians, there are unconfirmed reports of cyber attacks and jamming targeted against GLONASS systems, which may have degraded or even outright neutralized its performance in Ukraine. Ultimately, this has left Russian forces unable to prosecute targets with precision munitions and resorting to either laser guidance or saturation strikes with artillery or unguided bombs. The latter meaning Russian aircraft need to fly lower and closer to targets, resulting in heavier losses to their rotary and fixed wing close air support. Not to mention navigation is a lot harder across the entire Russian military. Next is a discussion around the ongoing communications issues suffered by the Russians in Ukraine. At this point in time, Russian units are still communicating via unencrypted short to medium range radios and mobile phones. And this, I have to reiterate, is all the way up to the battalion level. For the veterans in the comments section, could you imagine your battalion tactical frequency being unencrypted? Your close air support, your uh, JTAC, FI support. Could you imagine all of those frequencies being unencrypted? Well, in the war in Ukraine, at least from the Russian perspective, it is a reality. We now have confirmed information, however, as to why, thanks to some technical experts in the comments of my previous videos and from sources I've been able to get a hold of. It turns out the encryption systems used by the Russian forces rely on 3G and 4G to encrypt their radios. Yes, the stuff you're using on your mobile phone, perhaps even what you're using to watch this video. The problem is the local networks are all either controlled by the Ukrainians or have been jammed and destroyed by the Russians in the opening phase of the invasion. So the obvious answer is to put up your own communications relays. But the simple fact is the Russians don't have enough, and Russian phone providers are being jammed or aren't within range inside Ukraine, so they don't have any 3G or 4G coverage, resulting in many of them having to use Ukrainian SIM cards, which, again, means they can be watched. Thus, all of their encryption systems, because of these failings, don't work and so they've been using radios or mobile phones, both of which the Ukrainians have, again, been either jamming or listening in on. In fact, the reason we have now been able to confirm that seven Russian senior commanders have been killed, most likely more by the time this video comes out, is because the Ukrainians intercepted the reports of their deaths via phone calls to Moscow. And that is another thing. Casualties among senior officers, along with higher casualty figures in general, have caused a significant degradation in command and control, as well as their overall combat effectiveness. I will post the current projected casualty figures here, as well as the latest from the Attack on Europe project, though I would specify that there is going to be an inflation by about 20% by my estimate, due to the nature of kill claims in combat. Overclaiming is common, as we've established. But going back to communications, there are also ongoing communications issues throughout the Russian military in terms of inter-service communication and inter-unit communication. They can't talk between different branches or even different units. It's been confirmed that some Russian units even deployed without their RTOs. They didn't have their signal company attached to their battalion tactical groups, meaning at the higher levels of organization, company, battalion, no one can talk to one another. They have to go through, they have to go up the chain 
and then go back down again. Meaning the coordination of large-scale operations is essentially damn near impossible. This has led to everything from friendly fire instances between Russian forces, as well as offensive operations being completely uncoordinated, which allows the Ukrainians to conduct what's called a defeat in detail, where you engage one Russian unit at a time instead of having to face the entire enemy force all at once. Because the battalion tactical groups and the different units inside it are all hitting the Ukrainians at different points at different times, one at a time, because they can't talk to each other, the Ukrainians just kill one, then move and kill the other one. And of course, the other major issue of this problem is that it compromises the interconnectivity of a combined arms force. The Russian doctrine operates traditionally as part of deep battle, which is a combined arms doctrine, where all branches coordinate their forces in a large, multi-layered offensive, which hit a front line in a massive coordinated wave and then exploit breakthroughs. With the communications problems that the Russians have, they haven't been able to fight in the way they are trained and organized to fight. All those big set piece exercises they usually do have not been able to be carried out because of these massive communications issues. They have been unable to bring in close air support, artillery, or even integrated fire support such as their mortars to the battle space. With most artillery ending up being area bombardments with MLRS or indiscriminate shelling, this has led to minimal effectiveness against the defending force and, as a result, much higher civilian casualties. The Ukrainians, by contrast, have not had this problem, and have been utilizing their limited close air support assets, and especially their artillery, to great effect, striking Russian forces in their encampments and in convoy. Anyway, with these two major oversights from my previous videos addressed, we should move on to cover the current news. Once again, I'll be using Jemini of the West's excellent battle maps as a background, while I give you an overview of the situation. In recent days, the war in Ukraine has taken a dramatic turn. On the 25th of March, the Ukrainian armed forces announced a turning point in the defense of their country. As the situation developed, it became clear that this was in fact the beginnings of a Ukrainian counterattack in the region around Kiev. The progress of these counteroffensives were remarkable, given the limited resources the Ukrainians have available to launch large-scale operations. But the fact is, given their overextended supply lines, exhausted and demoralized troops, their degrading capability and lack of support, the Russians were not expecting nor prepared for the defenders to sally forth with this level of aggression. As the saying goes, everyone has a plan until they get hit in the face. Around Chernihiv, on Kiev's eastern flank, the Ukrainians threw back Russian forces upwards of 50 kilometers, inflicting heavy losses on them in the process. This axis of advance by the Russians was the most vulnerable, as the defenders based in Chernihiv have managed to deny the use of the city's road and rail network to the invading force, resulting in the already devastating logistics crisis suffered by the Russians to be acute in this particular area, as the advance was stretched along the ring roads and the two singular highways in the region. In conjunction with this, on the western front of the Kiev region, a full-scale counter-offensive was launched by the Ukrainian regular army units held in reserve along the left flank of the Russian advance, causing the Russians to collapse into a defensive position and dig in. By drawing the Russian reserves and support assets away, this opened up an opportunity for the Kiev garrison to go on the attack, resulting in a tooth and nail fight for the city of Iprin. But ultimately, the city was liberated. While to the north, Ukrainian troops advanced along the shore of the Dnieper Reservoir towards Chernobyl and Pripyat liberating towns along the way. These moves resulted in a dire tactical situation for the Russian position around Kiev, as their advance units, the majority of which being comprised of their best forces in the region, 4th Guards Tank and the VDV, were at serious risk of being encircled. The loss of these professional troops and their equipment would be a disaster that the Russians could not afford. As such, the order was given for those units to pull back to defensive positions around Hostomel and the ever-shrinking perimeter. 
In response, the Ukrainian forces intensified artillery and drone strikes and maintained their advance, keeping their momentum going. The mobile tactics of Ukrainian troops and their aggression prevented the Russians from organizing a solid defensive line, instead focusing on setting up strong points on key towns and strategic objectives, in a mirror of Ukrainian tactics in the early stages of the war. This would, as of several days ago, result in a complete withdrawal of Russian forces from all the areas in northern Ukraine. Meanwhile, in the eastern sector, Ukrainian and Russian forces are still locked in a back-and-forth struggle over the city of Kharkiv, with Ukrainian units launching local counterattacks and liberating towns as soon as the Russians take them. Here too, like around Kiev, the Russians have failed to make a decisive breakthrough to encircle the city, or pull together enough men and equipment to launch a direct assault. That said, Ukrainian forces have had a harder time pushing the Russians out of this area due to its proximity to the Russian border, allowing for the Russian logistics hubs in Belgorod, Kursk, and Voronezh to supply the forces dug in on the approach to the city directly. But this theatre was the site of what must be the most audacious operation launched by either side in this conflict. While Ukrainian sources, obviously, can neither confirm nor deny their operational information or their capabilities, it was confirmed by official Russian sources and OSINT on the ground that Ukrainian army aviation assets comprised of Mi-24 Hind gunships attacked and destroyed the main fuel storage facility in Belgorod. This was the main fuel depot for the forces advancing on Kharkiv. A raid conducted at below treetop height through the Russian air defense network and into Russia itself, striking at a strategic target crucial to operations underway in the eastern part of Ukraine. That is incredible. They flew under the trees, into Russia, and out again, taking out a crucial target on the way. This is the stuff that books are written about. Due to the heavy attritional nature of the fighting, the supply situation, and just the sheer number of losses on both sides, the front line in this region is relatively stable for now, with neither side being able to move. But in keeping with their established doctrine during this war up to now, as their advance has been stalled, Russian forces have since switched to a blanket bombardment of Kharkiv, with MLRS and artillery, causing severe damage to the city and its surrounding districts, with the inevitable heavy civilian casualties. With the destruction of their fuel supplies and Ukrainian heavy units freed up due to the Russian withdrawal from Kiev, there are signs that a Ukrainian counterattack to relieve the pressure on Kharkiv is even now beginning to take shape, though for operational security and due to the fact that all those movements are classified, that is unconfirmed, and even if I did know anything, I wouldn't say. Meanwhile, in the Donbass, the main focus of the Russian advance has shifted here. Air operations from the Russian Strategic Bomber Force, based at Engels Air Force Base, have intensified with standoff cruise missile strikes, as have close air support missions from frontal aviation assets. But across the entirety of Ukraine, Russian rotary-winged operations, their helicopters, have been scaled back massively. Casualties to man pads, man portable air defense systems, Stinger missiles, have been catastrophic, with helicopter losses reaching critical levels. This has robbed the Russians of one of their most powerful close air support assets, especially seeing as their best use is in dealing with Ukrainian irregular formations, which make up the majority of the forces in the Donbass region. NATO supplies have proven to be a game changer. Systems such as the Javelin, Enlor, Stinger, and the other NATO manpad systems, such as Starstreak, provided by the UK, which downed this Mi-28. Particular mention must also be given to the Poles and their Grom and Pirun systems. They have performed remarkably well. That said, however, Russian ground operations here in the Donbass, due to the lack of heavier Ukrainian units, as well as their closer proximity to a more developed region of Russia nearing Rostov and Volgograd, have allowed for more significant gains. But thanks to the defenders in Kharkiv, the grand deep battle encirclement that the Russian lines of advance suggest they were attempting has not materialized, and so the Ukrainian defenders have managed to conduct an expertly done 
fighting retreat, all in good order, while inflicting heavy casualties on both Russian and separatist forces. The withdrawal of Russian troops from the northern advance has been corroborated with satellite photos showing a build-up of staging areas and forward operations bases in this region and in the Donbass breakaway states, which indicates where those Russian forces are going to be redeployed to. Having failed to take the primary strategic objectives in western Ukraine, the Russian High Command appears to be reorientating to achieve local objectives, securing the Donbass being the primary one. Given that the security and recognition of these regions were one of the primary courses belly from the Kremlin, my guess, and this is only a guess from my historian and political science angle, is that Russia, having failed to achieve a total victory, is shifting for a symbolic and political victory in order to save face and ensure political security in Russia, allowing them to withdraw while acting like they've won. Much like the Chinese during their invasion of Vietnam, who after getting half their army destroyed by Vietnamese troops who all had three decades of combat experience, they declared the road to Hanoi was open before immediately running away, withdrawing and suing for peace. Given that peace talks in Turkey between Russia and Ukraine have been ramped up to the point where there are rumours of drafted ceasefire agreements and a meeting between Putin and Zelensky, I'd say there is evidence to support such a development. But after the recent discoveries made in the towns around the liberated areas, I think that is most likely not going to happen. But I'll talk about that later in the video. Moving to the southern theatre of operations. Mariupol, after being besieged by Russian forces since the very opening days of the campaign, still holds out amidst a horrific bombardment and brutal street-to-street -street combat. The infamous Azov Regiment has since been decimated in brutal house-to-house -house fighting against Chechen fighters and separatist forces, while other Ukrainian National Guard units have been slowly pushed back into the city centre. The city itself has essentially been razed to the ground by continuous artillery bombardment, including the use of thermobaric weapons and shore bombardment from Russian warships. Russian marine units have been sighted in the city itself proper, while armoured units have taken losses trying to approach through the streets. But, in scenes reminiscent of the Siege of Odessa in June of 1941 during the German invasion, the defenders of Mariupol have declared that they will hold their position to the last man in order to pin down the Russian troops necessary to destroy them. This sacrifice has come at a cost, with Mariupol's population suffering horribly during the fighting, with some estimates numbering civilian casualties in the tens of thousands mostly victims of Russian shellfire. And finally, the last area to cover is the southern region of Ukraine. And here too, the Ukrainians pulled off a rather audacious and impressive operation to destroy Russian amphibious landing capability, launching a cruise missile strike on a group of Russian alligator-class landing ships at the port of Berdyansk, sinking one and heavily damaging another. This action has essentially invalidated any further amphibious operations in the Black Sea, allowing the Ukrainian defenders to redirect professional units garrisoned in Odessa and the surrounding regions to support combat operations in the Kherson region, checking Russian advances across the Dnieper River and potentially laying the groundwork for a counterattack against the occupied city of Kherson itself, a city which has resisted occupation and protested the occupying troops every single day without fail since the Russian forces took the city, resulting in instances of Russian troops firing on the civilian population. That completes the roundup of the current military situation and the developments of the past fortnight. On to the reasons why, and as the title suggests, the activities of Russian troops in these occupied regions. Given the ongoing situation, the military issues are more of the same, as previous analyses done by myself, other channels, and subject matter experts have already covered. The main issues are still the same. 
Russia does not have air superiority. This is still the biggest and most devastating consequence for the invading force. Their lack of a comprehensive seed or SEAD campaign has left the Ukrainian air defense intact, and as a result, close air support missions have been limited, while helicopter operations due to the proliferation of manned portable anti-air systems have essentially been corded. The Russian air units can't fly low due to the portable ground threat, and they can't fly high due to the SAM threat. This flexible mobility of the Ukrainian air defense has been, in my opinion, the most vital factor in Ukrainian success. Preventing the Russians from conducting recon, close air support, or concentrated strikes. The big update regarding Ukraine's air defense comes in the form of a much needed primary source. A Ukrainian MiG 29 pilot, call sign Juice, recently gave an interview describing the situation. He outlines the struggle faced by Ukraine's pilots, particularly in dealing with surface to air missile systems, Russian AWACS, and Russian active missile capability. At this time, the Ukrainians only have access to semi-active missiles, which require terminal guidance provided by the launch aircraft, meaning that the Ukrainian fighters have to keep their aircraft pointed at the enemy until the missile hits the target, while the Russian fighters can launch their missiles, which have radars built into them, which means they track the targets on their own, so the Russians can fire their missiles and then run away before the Ukrainians can fire back. But despite this, the Ukrainians are operating from hidden dispersal bases and even from the highways in western Ukraine. Ukrainian pilots are still active. They are still mounting combat air patrols, close air support missions, and shooting down Russian aircraft invading their airspace. And with the Russian withdrawal from Kiev, that frees up a lot of airspace in central Ukraine for them to use to establish or re-establish bases. The way they've achieved their success is through the use of unconventional tactics in air defense and extremely high coordination between Ukrainian ground-based air defense systems, surface-to-air missiles, and stinger teams, and their fighters. One method Juice described was using their MiGs either as bait or as a high-priority threat, and then using the Russian response to their movements to shepherd them into surface-to-air missile free-fire zones, where the Ukrainian air defenders don't have to worry about accidentally hitting their friends. Once in there, they unleash hell and destroy the target. However, despite demonstrating the high morale and professionalism expected of a Ukrainian pilot fighting under these conditions, he was also very honest about the situation. The Russians haven't been able to launch a seed campaign, but they do have seed capability. And when they do manage to launch concerted raids over a particular area, their modern electronic warfare capability, combined with AWACS and their KH-31 anti-radiation missiles, allow for the Russians to knock out Ukrainian SAMs and jam the radar of their fighters, making interception impossible. It takes the Russians a lot of resources, and often casualties amongst the seed flight, but when they do get their shit together, they simply overpower the Ukrainian defenders. Furthermore, the simple attrition of this bloodier struggle is wearing down their fuel, munitions, and aircraft stocks. The feats of the Ukrainian pilots are what resulted in the legend of the Ghost of Kiev. Flying their MiGs at Mach Jesus while their exhaust can light your barbecue as they fly past. And on that note, Juice does say that despite the fact that his claims are exaggerated by the public and the media, there is indeed a MiG-29 ace in his squadron, and that once the war is over, the full details of their missions can be made public. We will find out eventually who the real ghost of Kiev is. But Juice is a man of honesty. He spits nothing but straight facts. What Ukraine needs more than anything is more modern equipment, better fighters, better missiles, and up-to-date command and control systems. Replacement MiGs from Poland would be a good start, but crash course programs for the training of F-16 pilots and the activation of some US surplus Vipers should be a priority. Along with, as Juice puts it, as many AMRAM missiles as you can send us. All of these decisions are up to the NATO countries to decide on, and in my view, they should make every effort to support the Ukrainian Air Force, short of actively joining ourselves and starting World War III. Whatever the Ukrainians ask for, within reason, they should get it, in my view. But I am sure of one thing. These men will go down in history, along with the RAF pilots during the Battle of Britain, as men who triumphed against the odds. As from what I and what the world has seen, 
I no longer have any doubts in my mind whatsoever. They're going to win this thing. Transferring the discussion over to the Russian logistics situation, due to their withdrawal from Kiev and the consolidation around areas within Russia's operational control zone of the Donbass and Crimea, Russia has most likely started seriously addressing their logistics issues. They are no longer trucking an entire army down three highways in the middle of enemy territory through Belarus, and have instead switched to a more methodical step-by-step advance throughout the southern and eastern areas of Ukraine. They have ports on the Sea of Azov, such as Berdyansk, to supply their offensive against Mariupol directly. Their success in taking Kurtison and that city's proximity to Crimea allows them to use the entirety of the road and railway network to supply their forces in the region. And the fact that Kharkiv and the Donbass are essentially an hour's drive from Russia proper means they have a short logistics tail, able to travel through areas they almost completely control. Nevertheless, Russian losses in trucks have been quite simply catastrophic, and they are in the middle of redeploying entire divisions to the Eastern Theatre. So it would be a safe bet that while the peace talks are ongoing, Russia will take a tactical pause to reorganize their supply chain, get fuel and ammo dumps set up, and prepare for sustained combat operations once the spring weather dries the mud and allows for a more aggressive form of open field mechanized operations, which the agricultural plains of Ukraine's eastern steppe are ideally suited for. Simply put, as Klauswitz so eloquently says, Russia has reached its culmination point, the furthest they can advance with the forces they have and the supplies available. But make no mistake, despite the damage they've taken, Russia still has large reserves of men, warehouses filled with stored Soviet equipment, and an entire continent worth of resources behind them. With a man like Putin in charge, despite their losses, and the now pretty much guaranteed defeat, politically he can't back down without scoring some form of victory in the field, which is most likely what their projected upcoming offensive in the Donbass is supposed to achieve. But let us not forget, you need two sides to hold a war, and the Ukrainians are more than aware of the upcoming phase of battle, and NATO has confirmed they will be receiving assets to facilitate this phase. The former Soviet states in NATO have confirmed in partnership with the US that they will be transferring large quantities of their surplus T-72 tanks, along with their equipment and ammunition. More javelins, N-laws and German Panzerfausts are arriving every day. More manpads and surface-to-air missile systems along with them to close off the airspace to Russian frontal aviation. And Ukrainian units defending Kiev have almost certainly started redeploying. Though again, these aren't confirmed and we don't know exactly where, nor would I or anyone else say if we knew. But President Zelensky has made it clear to Moscow that territorial concessions are not on the table. Ukraine has already demonstrated their willingness to retake ground, and it would not shock me if they have an offensive of their own lined up. But I'm not a general, nor do I have classified information. So, as with all developing situations, the die is cast and we shall see. Now, for an update on the Russian communication situation. And it will be brief. That was my face hitting my desk. It's still horrible, but like with the logistics situation, they are operating closer to their borders within 4G range, and they will most likely start resolving their issues in time before major operations resume. If they don't, it will be costly. And while again I am happy that the Russians are being so inept, as it means the Ukrainians will get their homes back, it still hurts my brain. As I said in my previous video, I used to work in telecommunications, and the Russian telecommunications have just been a farce. And with that, that just about covers everything operationally in a broad sense. Well, besides the weather, but that's pretty obvious. For more in-depth looks, I recommend digging into the specific videos on each issue and checking through Jemini of the West's battle maps in more detail. Also, specific mention to Military Aviation History's video on the air defense situation, and that's an excellent place to start for that area, and you can't go wrong with the Attack on Europe project to get an accurate assessment of losses of both sides. Now, on to the last part of the video. And again... 
This is a content warning. I'm not going to show any photos or pictures of these events for obvious reasons. YouTube will descend upon me like the hammer of Thor if I do, and quite frankly, the images I have seen in the OSINT space have been so horrifying I don't feel like circulating them anyway. If you go looking for them, you'll find them. Simply put, this last part is a report on war crimes conducted by Russian forces and the horrific situation we have seen now that Kiev and Sumy Oblast are back under full Ukrainian control, as well as the ongoing crimes against humanity being conducted by Russia throughout the country at large. The footage being shown here is the city of Mariupol, currently under siege by Russian forces. The city is completely destroyed. Of particular note is the bombed-out theatre. As you can see, it is clearly marked children on the ground in front of the building on either side. And the theatre itself is in a square adjacent to a park far from any city buildings containing entrenched Ukrainian forces. The bombing of this building was intentional. And it's a war crime. Under the Geneva and Hague Conventions, this building was clearly marked as a shelter for non-combatants, visible from the air via satellite aircraft and drone. Its location was separate from all potential legitimate military targets. And this is something that I want to address, and something that I have had enough of listening to. A lot of comments on videos reporting the war in Ukraine, including mine, in fact especially mine given that it's reporting the news, claim that Russia is only not making headway because they are not resorting to traditional total war tactics in order to prevent civilian casualties. Well, I ask you to take a look at the footage here from Mariupol and Kharkiv, where they have been indiscriminately launching grad strikes against civilian areas. Russia is intentionally killing civilians in an effort to terrorize the population and reduce their will to fight. The Russians have demonstrated that the gloves are well and truly off and they will do whatever they feel is necessary while lying openly about it to their people and to the world. While waging war is in of itself a crime. Someone, I can't remember who, defined it as armed robbery on a mass scale. Destroying buildings to win battles is a fact of life. It's something that happens. And in a global conflict, in a total war between superpowers, bombing population centers is a fact of life. It's a strategic target. It happens. But this, this is neither of those things. There is no military goal this is the deliberate targeting of civilians for the sole purpose of killing to instill fear. That's not war. That's murder. And if only the Russians were just restricted to that. The full extent is far worse. Since the liberation of Kiev, Chernihiv, and Sumy, and other regions by Ukrainian forces, we have confirmed photographic evidence of mass graves. Pits filled with bodies numbering up to at least 500 people in the area around the town of Buka. Kremlin sources today claim that these people were killed by retreating Ukrainian forces or during the fighting, and that they were buried respectfully by Russian troops. As for the bodies of civilians gunned down in the street, there were claims that these were resistance fighters and protesters obstructing the movement of Russian forces. Now forgive my ignorance, Mr. Putin, and any of the Russian trolls in the chat who may be watching, but I've seen the pictures coming out of Bucha, and I don't think three-year-old girls dumped in a mass grave are political dissidents or resistance fighters. All throughout the country, we have seen video evidence of Russian forces firing on civilian vehicles and shelling relief corridors. 
we have confirmed reports of refugee convoys being attacked by Russian aircraft, and intercepted radio calls show Russian forces calling artillery into civilian areas to screen retreats, as it will force the Ukrainian forces in the area to go and render first aid and recovery efforts. The Russians, while they're running away, shell civilian areas so Ukrainian forces will be forced to go and rescue their countrymen. And it gets worse. In the wake of the withdrawal from the areas around Kiev, Chernihiv, and Sumy, Ukrainian engineers have been unable to mount a significant recovery operation and a burial party for the people killed by Russian forces. The reason they haven't been able to recover the bodies of these people is due to the fact that the Russians have mined the area, with confirmed reports that some of the bodies abandoned in the open have been booby-trapped. And evidence of all of these crimes has been reported everywhere throughout liberated territory, including satellite images of areas throughout Ukraine where churchyards and waste disposal sites have evidence of large trenches having been dug and filled in, their purpose having only one possible explanation, which leads to the speculation that such conduct, especially around the occupied city of Kherson, is universal. One of the obscenest reports, though tragically unsurprising, is reports of mass assaults by Russian troops against Ukrainian women in the occupied regions. Use of the appropriate word to describe their violation is, in of itself, a violation of YouTube's community guidelines. But when I say Russian troops and assaults, against young women, I'm pretty sure you know exactly what I mean. And the result of this has been that a sizable number of the bodies found in the mass graves were young women, prevented from revealing the criminal acts done to them. Meanwhile, looting, as seen on film across various places, and on CCTV cameras and located in banks, businesses, and petrol stations. Looting has now been confirmed to have been the standard operation procedure. With the houses in occupied areas having been ransacked, refugees robbed of their possessions when passing through Russian lines, and in many cases, when the looting of their home was opposed, the occupants shot. The scale and uniformity of these crimes, reported across Russian-occupied territory, in my view, only leads to one conclusion. They weren't the crimes you would expect to see in any army in a foreign land during a war. No. With the new, overwhelming, incontrovertible and damning evidence presented to us in these past few days, it is clear. These crimes bear the hallmarks of organization, and as such, they must have been ordered. These crimes must have been ordered. The fact that they're everywhere, all over the place, and not in little scattered, isolated incidents, the fact that they are universal, this is organized and deliberate. Putin and his regime must answer. As a historian, and full disclosure, someone on the political left who is virulently opposed to imperialism from any country, whether it be Russia, the United States, China, as someone who has ridden the neutral line of geopolitics for the past 10 years of my life, there is no such thing as neutrality in this war anymore. There is no longer room to be neutral or unbiased on this war anymore. George Orwell, the author of 1984 and a veteran of the Socialist Volunteers in the Spanish Civil War, laid it out very clearly 90 years ago. Neutrality and pacifism in the face of fascist aggressors is tacit approval. Neutrality and impartiality on this topic is an enabler of aggression and the crimes we've seen, not a moral high ground. Putin and his cronies must answer. And after this point, I have no longer any doubt in my mind that the Ukrainians will win. 
and justice will prevail. They have to. Otherwise, we as a species have learned nothing from our previous mistakes. But I've been talking for too long, and as you can probably tell, I... <laughs> I'm just about done. I feel that no words I could convey could get across what's appropriate here. And I'm not a Ukrainian, so I don't have the right. As such, I'll leave you with President Zelensky's address. Slava Ukraine. Сьогодні це звернення буде без привітання, не хочеться жодного зайвого слова. Президенти зазвичай не записують таких звернень, як це. Але сьогодні я повинен сказати саме так. Сказати після того, що відкрилося в Бучі та інших наших містах, звідки вигнали окупантів, сотні вбитих людей, закатованих, розстріляних, мирних людей. Тіла на вулицях, замінована територія, заміновані навіть тіла вбитих. Повсюди наслідки мародерства. На нашій землі побувало концентровано зло, вбивці, кати, гвалтівники, мародери, які називають себе армією і які заслуговують тільки на смерть після того, що вони зробили. Я хочу, щоб кожна мать, кожного російського солдата побачила тіла вбитих людей в Бучі, в Ірпені, в Гастомелі. Що вони зробили? За чим їх вбили? Що зробив мужчина, який їхав по вулиці на велосипеді? За чим питали до смерті звичайних мирних людей в звичайному мирному місті? За чим душили жінок після того, як вирували у них з ушей серки? Як можна було насилувати жінок і вбивати їх на очах у дітей? издеваться над их телами даже после смерти. Зачем давили танками тела людей? Что сделал в вашей России украинский город Буча? Как это все стало возможным? Российские матери, даже если вы растили мародеров, то как они стали еще и палачами? Вы не могли не знать, что внутри у ваших детей. Вы не могли не заметить, что они лишены всего человеческого, нет души, нет сердца. Они убивали сознательно и с удовольствием. Я хочу, чтобы все руководители Российской Федерации увидели, как выполняются их приказы. Вот такие приказы, вот такое исполнение и солидарная ответственность за эти убийства, за эти пытки, за эти оторванные взрывами руки, которые лежат на улицах, за выстрелы в затылок связанным людям. Вот так теперь будет восприниматься российское государство. Это ваш образ. Ваша культура и человеческий облик погибли вместе с украинцами и украинками, к которым вы пришли. Я принял решение про створение специального механизма правосудия в Украине для расследования та судового розгляду каждого злочного окупантов на территории нашей державы. Суть этого механизма – спільна работа национальных и международных фахівців, следующих прокуроров и судей. Цей механізм дозволить Україні та світу притягти до конкретної відповідальності осіб, які розв'язали або будь-яким чином брали участь у цій страшній війні проти українського народу та у злочинах проти наших людей. Міністерство закордонних справ, Офіс генерального прокурора, Національна поліція, Служба безпеки України, розвідка та інші структури згідно зі своєю компетенцією повинні направити усі зусилля на те, щоб механізм запрацював негайно. Закликаю усіх наших громадян та друзів України у світі, які можуть долучитися до цієї роботи і допомогти встановленню справедливості зробити це. Світ бачив вже багато воєнних злочинів у різні часи, на різних континентах, але настав час зробити все, щоб воєнні злочини російських військових стали останнім проявом такого зла на землі. Кожен винний у таких злочинах буде внесений у спеціальну книгу палачів, буде знайдений і покараний. Українці, українки, хочу, щоб ви це усвідомлювали. Ми вигнали ворога з території декількох областей, але під контролем російських військ ще залишаються окуповані райони інших областей. І після вигнання окупантів звідти можуть відкритися ще страшні речі, 
ще більше смертей і знущань. Бо така природа російських військових, які прийшли на нашу землю. Це виродки, які не вміють інакше, і такі у них були накази. Всі партнери України будуть детально проінформовані про те, що відбувалося на тимчасово окупованій території нашої держави. Воєнні злочини в Бучі та інших містах під час російської окупації будуть предметом розгляду і на Раді безпеки ООН у вівторок. Обов'язково буде і новий санкційний пакет проти Росії. Але впевнений, що цього замало. Потрібні ще висновки не тільки про Росію, але й про політичну поведінку, яка фактично дозволила цьому злу прийти на нашу землю. Сьогодні 14-та річниця саміту НАТО у Бухаресті. Тоді був шанс забрати Україну з сірої зони на сході Європи, з сірої зони між НАТО і Росією, з сірої зони, про яку в Москві думають, що їм тут все дозволено. Навіть найстрашніші воєнні злочини за оптимістичними дипломатичними формулюваннями про те, що Україна нібито може стати членом НАТО тоді. У 2008 році була захована відмова приймати Україну в Альянс. Був захований безглуздий страх деяких політиків перед Росією. Вони думали, що відмовивши Україні, зможуть заспокоїти Росію. Зможуть переконати її поважати Україну і нормально жити поруч із нами. За 14 років після того помилкового розрахунку Україна пережила революцію і 8 років війни на Донбасі. А тепер боремось за життя у найстрашнішій війні у Європі за увесь час після Другої світової війни. Я запрошую пані Меркель, пана Саркозі відвідати Бучу і побачити, до чого за 14 років призвела політика поступок Росії. Побачити на власні очі закатованих українців і українок. Хочу, щоб мене зрозуміли правильно. Ми не звинувачуємо Захід. Ми не звинувачуємо нікого, окрім конкретних російських військових, які скоїли це проти наших людей. Окрім ще тих, хто віддав їм наказ. Але ми маємо право говорити про нерішучість, про те, яким був шлях до такої Бучі, до такого Гостомолю, до такого Харкова, до такого Маріуполя. У нас немає нерішучості, у якому би блоці чи поза блоком ми не були. Ми розуміємо одне – ми маємо бути сильними. 14 років тому керівник Росії в Бухаресті сказав західним лідерам, що немає такої країни, як Україна. А ми доводимо, що є така країна. Була і буде. Ми не будемо ховатися за сильними світу цього. Ми не будемо нікого умовляти. По-хорошому, ми не повинні були і просити про допомогу зброєю, щоб захиститись від цього зла, яке прийшло на нашу землю. Всю необхідну зброю нам і так мали надати, без прохань. Бо і самі прекрасно усвідомлювали, яке зло прийшло і що саме воно принесло із собою. Ми бачимо, що на кону в цій війні, ми бачимо, що ми захищаємо. Є стандарти української армії, моральні та професійні. І це не наша армія має тепер підлаштовуватись. Це багатьом іншим арміям треба повчитись у наших військових. І є стандарти українських людей, і є стандарти російських окупантів. Це добро і зло. Це Європа і чорна діра, яка хоче усе це розірвати і поглинути. Ми переможемо в цій війні, навіть якщо окремі політики так і не зможуть перемогти нерішучість, яку вони передають наступникам разом із своїми посадами. І в Бучі вже працюють усі необхідні служби, щоб повернути місто до життя, відновити подачу електрики, подачу води, відновити роботу медичних установ. Відновити інфраструктуру, дати безпеку людям. Бо Росію вигнали, а Україна повертається. І повертає життя. Відвідав сьогодні у шпиталі прикордонної служби України наших прикордонників, наших героїв, поранених бійців. Вісьмом вручив державні нагороди, також відзначив нагороду і лікаря, ортопеда, травматолога, офіцера медичної служби, який є провідним військовим травматологом України і врятував вже багатьох наших українських захисників. Загалом, відповідним указом відзначив державними нагородами 41 прикордонника. Саме військовослужбовці Державної прикордонної служби 
першими зустріли вогнем окупантів, коли вони пішли у наступ 24 лютого. Зараз наші хлопці і дівчата повертаються на державний кордон, коли окупантів ми виганяємо. Впевнений, прийде час і буде відновлена вся лінія державного кордону України. І щоб це сталося швидше, ми всі маємо бути зосередженими, готовими сміливо дивитися в очі злу і відповідати на кожну злочинну дію проти України, проти наших людей, проти нашої свободи. Зло буде покарано. Слава Україні!